right, well, thank you all for joining us for this presentation. Uh, I'm Michael McKelvey, and I'm Rebecca Bird. Yep, and uh, many of you probably already know us, uh, but we are going to be talking about using Minecraft in the classroom, uh, getting started with it. Um, I guess here's I jumped ahead. So uh, we are actually giving a presentation that we're going to be giving in a couple of weeks at an ICTM, Illinois Council of Teachers of Mathematics, talk. And so uh, you may notice it's sort of geared toward teachers and possibly math teachers specifically. Uh, so may or may not be 100% applicable to you, but hopefully there will be uh, useful stuff that you can get out of it. We uh, are and very interested in feedback yes. um, so that we can kind of fix any bugs in the presentation before uh, the ICTM conference. Yeah. So especially if you hear us using technical terms that you don't understand or if we're going too fast or something doesn't seem clear, please let us know. Um, we'd love to have your feedback. Absolutely. And feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, this is very informal and you're welcome to interrupt us and ask away or tell us if something doesn't make sense. Uh, so Okay, so introducing Minecraft. Uh, how many people here have heard of Minecraft before? Yeah, that's pretty unanimous. How many people have played Minecraft before? Much less than <laughs> All right. Um, so <laughs> yes, this is what we're expecting our audience to be at the conference as well. So. With any luck, we will be able to connect you to computers so that you can play a little bit of Minecraft before our presentation is over. We have Evan in the back madly uh, installing the Minecraft client on a bunch of computers. Uh, so, Minecraft is a game. Uh, it's one that's really um, taken the gaming community by storm. Um, kids, adults, everybody seems to really love Minecraft. Uh, it's it, what's called a sandbox game, which means that it doesn't have clear goals or clear storyline, unlike many other games that you might play. Um, the purpose is really to build and explore and do anything that you want, and it offers a lot of tools to kind of explore that creative outlet but very little in the way of guidance. So it's a nice tool for learning, but requires teachers to kind of be on top of what they want their students to get out of the program. Yeah. Um, it's very, uh, very open-ended, uh, very exploratory. You can kind of make whatever you want. Um, so there are two components, typically, when you're talking about Minecraft. You set up, there's a Okay, we're going to start a little bit earlier with terms server and client. This is not specific to Minecraft. In general, a server is a computer that is running some sort of software that allows um, clients to connect to it and do something, uh, provide some sort of resources. Uh, it acts sort of like the host at a dinner party. It provides a space for all of these people to come to. And um, resources for the uh, people to consume once they're there. A client, on the other hand, is more like the guest of the dinner party. It's a machine that connects to the server to take advantage of any resources that the server might be offering it. Um, in terms of Minecraft, um, the server and client have more specific um, kind of definitions. A Minecraft server is a computer that hosts the game. It provides the world that the players are going to be exploring and will negotiate interactions between the clients. The clients are the computers the students or teachers are using to play the game. So they will also have a copy of the game installed, but they will connect to the server and say, server, what does the world look like? Server, what does my inventory look like? Server, I want to hit this person. How much damage do I do? Um, so the server is the tool that facilitates multiplayer interaction um, within the game. Without a server, you can still play, but you can't play with other people. You can play single player mode, just you in a world by yourself, and that's fine. But if you want to get all of your students in your class together doing something collaboratively, um, all sort of learning together, all running around in a single world, uh, you do need to set up a server. Fortunately, uh, that's actually not as hard as you might think it would be, uh, because there is uh, this thing called Minecraft EDU, uh, which is built on top of Minecraft. Um, underneath, it's running Minecraft, but it gives you a bunch of tools that are useful in a classroom situation. Uh, it gives you uh, a simpler way to run Minecraft servers and clients. 
um, without really having to know all that much other than being able to click on some things. Uh, so we're going to demo how you actually set up a MyFraftDDU server, MyFraftDDU client, and how you get them to connect. So, the uh, main features of Minecraft EDU server um, are its uh, very ease of setup. Um, creating a Minecraft server on base vanilla Minecraft, vanilla being unmodified, kind of the Minecraft you get straight from Microsoft, um, is a pretty involved process um, that can be very difficult to negotiate, even if you're using a host that's kind of trying to help hold your hand the entire way through. Minecraft EDU, as long as you are on the same network as your students, makes it very easy. It's a few clicks to install the um, software initially, and then maybe two or three to get the server up and running for each class that you want to kind of run. It also has a lot of downloadable resources uh, made by teachers for teachers um, that kind of have worlds that are prepackaged to help you learn different concepts. Often these worlds will come with lesson plans already attached to them or handouts to give to your students. The client, the thing you use to play the game, also has a lot of nice features. Um, most importantly, that it is cheaper than buying a Minecraft account for every one of your students. Um, but it also has some controls that kind of help you manage the students in the classroom. If they aren't really paying attention to you, you can freeze them and say, hey, eyes on me, you're not playing the game until we, I tell you kind of what we're doing. Um, and some other tools that we'll kind of demonstrate for you that make playing the game a lot easier with your kids. Yeah, a lot of ways to manage your students and keep them from hopefully getting too far off task. Does this work only in the classroom? Can students go home on their home PC and then log into the same world using yes. the same account? Depending Sorry. on how you have it set up. So uh, one way you could do this is to kind of start up the server right when class begins and then shut it down when it's over. But if you want to, you can also just have a machine that all it's doing is running Minecraft. Um, this means you, it's harder to do kind of on the teacher's personal laptop, but if it's, you keep the server running, the kids will be able to go home, and if you've given them a copy of the Minecraft EDU software, which there are licensing rules for that, they will be able to connect to the server and do homework on there. I know a lot of teachers who kind of like a flipped classroom setting where they're doing a little bit of demo in um, the Minecraft stuff at home and then coming in and learning. Um, it's very possible, and they have kind of legal allowances for that as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing to be aware of is you probably have to work with network administrators at the school to make sure that, because um, you can run into networking issues just uh, in terms of the technology, that it's possible that um, the school's firewall would block things from, you know, block traffic going across. So it's possible that with some work from some tech people at a school, you could get you know, the server that you're running on your um, you know, classroom PC uh, actually reachable by the students at home. So it, it, there may be some technical challenges, uh, but it is at least theoretically possible. It is do. possible. We have done it. Um, it is a thing you can do, um, yeah. but. But it may require, it, it's more than just the you know, one click setup sort of thing. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think this is the demo portion. Yes. Um, these are the things you will need um, to get started. Um, and there's a disclaimer about technical requirements, Michael was just saying. Um, one of the most important things, a two-button mouse is not technically required, but makes it infinitely easier to play the game. And I highly recommend having one, um, because it cuts down on a lot of frustration. And a lot of kids who already play Minecraft will be used to having one of these. If your computer has Mac machines installed in the lab, you might not have um, mice with the left, left kick and right click but most Mac machines will work with most of these mice. Should be able to plug it in. So you might want to talk to your IT department about kind of getting one of those requested for your lab. Um, you also need one computer for each student unless you're kind of doing pair gaming, which is a model that works. But kind of every different person you want playing the game will need a computer. You also want one more computer to run the server. And so probably you'll want this to be the most powerful machine you have available to you because it has to negotiate connections for all of your students. A lot of teachers would maybe have a, a desktop machine um, at their desk, and that's probably what you'd end up wanting to use. And your um, students can play on laptops, so. Yeah. Uh, okay, so first step is you go and you purchase Minecraft EDU. It's not free, um, but it could be, you know, 
if you're going to be getting a good use out of it, it could be worth the money. We have slides we'll on get, licensing later in the yeah. presentation where we can explain the process. We will get to that. Uh, but essentially, you go to the Minecraft EDU website, you log in, and they have a link to download the installer. So you do that. Um, it is it all runs on Java, which is a cross-platform technology um, that uh, lets you install this on just about any operating system. Really. Um, Notably, Chromebook and Android and kind of iOS mobile um, Apple devices are excluded. You cannot run them on those. So uh, the next step is you run the installer and some things we already had open. Things <laughs> to be open. He's a partner mess. Okay, you so said you're, you said you're doing this at um, ISTA? Uh, I ICTM. ICTM. When, when, Sorry. when you do that, um, you might want to make very clear that you are not selling anything. No, um, no. And, and, and I mean, you'll get dinged on the evaluations. And so far, so far, you haven't made that really explicitly clear. Okay. Tell, I mean, and That's be very, very clear. Because lots of times, if I question on the um, evaluation form. Yeah, yeah. No feels, like, feels like feels like a pitch for right, exactly. right. So we're, make you know, very clear at the very beginning. That's that I find very that. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. We will we will start off with that. We are not associated. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to reiterate again and again. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of disclaimers. Purely providing yeah. information. Um. Okay, so you will end up with uh, an installer. We've renamed this one, but this is just something downloaded from their website. Uh, and you double click it, and you get sort of a standard installation window. Click continue. There's some information about Minecraft EDU that you can read, but at the moment we're just going to skip past it. We're just going to accept the terms of the license agreement. You, know, you probably want to actually read that if you're installing it on your own computer. And then we get to uh, choosing which things we're actually going to install. So. Uh, for the server, you're going to want to, the one thing you want to remember is to actually check this uh, Minecraft EDU server launcher, because uh, that's kind of the whole point of this installation. You can also choose to install it somewhere, wherever you really want to, uh, but we're just going to go ahead and do it in the default location uh, for, for this Mac. And we're doing this on a Mac right now, but it could just as easily be done on a PC. Or a Linux we'll machine with a graphical interface. Right. Like Ubuntu is a common distribution. Yeah. So and in a minute we'll show installing the client on a PC. I'm gonna show you it works really whatever system you're using. Uh, so the installation just finished. Continue. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the installer and open the launcher. <coughs> and so this is what that looks like. And uh, we have slides for all of this, but we thought it would be more helpful to actually see it happening. So uh, one thing we're going to do at the end is, or it's also on the handouts, is provide you uh, a link to this presentation. So it could be used later on if you, you know, wanted to go go back and see how this all works. Um, part of it is we want to provide sort of documentation for this whole process. So, um, Yeah, so now that he's on the um, launcher, um, since he wants to launch the servers for as soon as connect to, he's just going to click Start Minecraft EDU Server Launcher. Um, and so now he's at the kind of part of the process that he's um, already installed it, and in the future he'll just pull up that launcher, and this is what you'll do every time you want to start up the server. You won't have to reinstall it. Right. Um, this particular window, though, is a one-time thing. Uh, you choose a password that you're going to have as the teacher that is going to give you special uh, abilities within Minecraft. If so your students know this password, they can log in as a teacher and do things they shouldn't do. Yes, so, so do not share this with your students unless you really, really, really trust them. And we just 
just set the teacher password. So there we go. Uh, and next, I'm just going to start the server with the tutorial world. We're not going to worry about doing anything more advanced at this moment. The tutorial world is a really nice place to start with your students, even ones who already use Minecraft. Um, it very gently, as you'll see when I start kind of opening it up myself, introduces them to the controls of the world um, and kind of makes them do a little bit of self-exploration and um, uh, play with the game. It's a very nice kind of first activity for Minecraft if you are on a really tight schedule. Right. And so this is, uh, unfortunately we can't get it all on the screen because of doing this on the projector, I guess. Uh, but you get this, um, this window that shows you all of your options while running this server. And uh, there's all sorts of buttons over here that you can um, customize things, but we're not going to do any of that at the moment. That's sort of more to play with later. But the one thing to be that is really important is to make note of uh, that IP address where it says you can connect to this server using this address. This is what all of the client computers will need to know in order to connect to this server. So uh, ours is 192.168.1.100 in this case. So um, now on this screen over here, I am going to demonstrate what it's like to install the client. Uh, this is something you're going to need to do on every machine that your students are going to be using to connect. Um, I'd recommend doing it before they get there, but if you kind of have, uh, you know, technically um, inclined students, they might be able to help you out with it. Yeah. Um, this is when the same exact uh, launcher that Michael just downloaded for the server, um, but it's, you know, I'm going to put it on this machine. So use the same file for both of them and modify the instructions slightly. All right, so we're at the language screen again and we're, I'm going to agree to the licensing agreements. This time I'm going to leave server launcher unchecked. They don't need it on their machines and it's probably just going to confuse them if it's there. So uh, unless you have some good reason to install it, I'd recommend not using it. And I am actually going to change the location um, because I don't want it to overwrite the version that I already have on here. So I'm going to install it on my desktop in a new folder called 1.6.4 because that's the version of Minecraft I'm installing. But you can just leave it at the default directory and that will be fine. Um, it's going to go through this unzipping stage. It will take a little longer on my computer because mine's a little less powerful. Um, and then it's going to be done. Um, and I can close the installer and open the launcher, just like Michael did. I think it's probably going to pop up over here, though. Um, you also need, actually I don't want this version. I want this version. One moment, please. All right, I'm opening up the uh, launcher again. There's a short, it made a shortcut on my desktop, which again, you can't see because of the way the projector's working. I just double click that and I'm gonna start Minecraft EDU um, and then hit this launch button right here. And that's what they need to do to launch the server. One time, you're going to have to tell um, your students' computers where your server is. You're going to need to give it the address that is right up there. You do this once, and then as long as you don't change anything about the installation of your server, you never have to do it again, and it's all already there. So as soon as my game loads, I am going to show you guys how we do that. Um, any questions so far? You'll notice mine's taking a little longer to boot up than Michael's did. Um, we have my, more powerful hardware over here. Which is why we have that one running the server. Um, your students will be prompted to uh, type in their names um, every time they connect. Um, and then they're going to want to go to multiplayer mode. So this is where you're going to have to add your server. So you click this big add server button right here. You can name it whatever you want. Um, just make sure it's something your students will recognize. And then for the server address, you type in that number right there. And that's it. It's going to ping for a while, and then it's going to decide that I can connect. So you just double click that, and your students can choose a little person that they like. Um, that looks nice. And they hit this button, and that's, uh, that's all of it. Um, this is the tutorial world that I have running right now. Um, 
I'm moving around with the W, S, A, and D keys, um, which is kind of standard for most games. And you can see these signs are kind of explaining what, how, to, how to do things, and I need to move the mouse to look around. There's giant arrows telling me where to go. Um, I can interrupt really quickly. I just plugged in another laptop over here on which I had already installed the client, just like what Rebecca demonstrated. And so now you can see that um, I am able to view the world. I can see that there is one out of potentially 100 people already in the world. I see Rebecca's name. And I am going to also join the server. And I'm going to join as a student. Actually, no, I'm going to join as a teacher. So now it's asking me for the teacher password, and I will just type in what I typed in a moment ago, and then I will connect. And I am now also in this world, and there's Rebecca. There's Michael. So uh, right now, this computer right here is acting as the server. And this computer and that computer are both clients. They're all communicating with each other, or at least each of these computers is communicating with this one uh, in order to join this world. Um, you can see that, so most of you guys have played Minecraft before, so this may not um, make a whole lot of sense. Uh, stop me if I'm uh, not. Um, since I'm a student, I can't break things. Um, you can see I'm trying to break it, but it won't, and it's telling me that I'm not, I'm not allowed, essentially. Um, I can't hit Michael. Um, that's, not, that's not allowed. I can't fly, which you guys probably didn't know that, that was an option anyway, but that's something I can't do. Um, and I don't have anything in my inventory that I haven't been given. Um, so that's kind of uh, the things I'm limited to as, 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 as a student. Um, I also don't have access to that menu. I have, actually, where is it? I have this menu, so I can see assignments that Michael has given me um, and say whether or not I have completed them. But that's pretty much it. He, however, has a whole host of options that he can use to kind of manage and lead the student. Um, that, this screen lets him put himself in creative mode. Creative mode, as defined on your terminology sheet, is a game mode that allows him to fly by double tapping. Um, it allows them to break blocks instantly, um, and they don't drop anything. Um, and if he opens up his inventory by pressing the E key, um, he has access to pretty much infinite resources, any block that he could want, um, as many as he could want to build anything. Creative mode is great for kind of building structures without having to hand gather all of the resources necessary for them. If you don't want your students, um, if you are okay with your students having access to any block, um, including some kind of dangerous ones like lava, and you want them to kind of be able to freely build without any middle steps in between, creative mode is great, and you can give them access to this mode. But Michael can also get it on his own without giving it to me, because he's a teacher. Um, he has some other tools that are useful um, on that same menu he was showing you earlier. Um, on the world tab, he can toggle some settings about the world. Um, he turned off, uh, it kind of comes with fire turned off so a student can't light something on fire and burn everything down. Um, he also isn't allowing monsters to spawn so monsters can't come and try to kill us, um, which is a kind of a thing that is on in normal Minecraft. Your students might ask you where the monsters have gone. Um, but he can turn them on and off. Um, he can also change the difficulty, which doesn't matter for Minecraft EDU game mode. But if he toggles that game mode tab on the left, um, he can put everybody into creative mode or survival mode. Um, creative mode is the thing he was just showing you. Survival mode is the mode where you take fall damage and have to hand out of things and can die um, if you jump into a pit full of lava. Um, he also has student management settings. Um, he can enable or disable PvP. PvP is player versus player combat. So with it disabled, nobody can attack each other. Your students are also probably going to ask you why they can't do that. But we have found that in most classroom environments, turning it off is conducive to learning. Um, yes. Because they are students like to just go around battling each other and trying to kill each other. Yes. Uh, as a surprise to no one, probably. Um, so you can also freeze us, which I find to be a very useful tool. And will often freeze the students preemptively before I even let them join the world, like before they get to the classroom. So he froze me, I can't look around, 
I can't move. You, I'm trying to, but I can't. Um, and this kind of stops them and has them refocus their attention on you, um, which is very useful. You can also individually free students in the kind of individual player tab, which is the next one over. Um, so it's off right now because everybody's frozen. But generally, there's a tool there that he can use to um, freeze and unfreeze me. Um, and this is very useful if an individual student is doing something he shouldn't, and your students say, hey, Jake is breaking my house. You can freeze Jake and go talk to him and say, hey, this is not um, acceptable behavior. Um, kind of get a one-on-one -on -one of them without disrupting the rest of the class. Um, he can teleport me to him. He can teleport himself to me. Um, he can individually give me creative game mode, which we often use as a reward for students who have completed all of the classroom activities. Um, after they kind of do everything they're supposed to do, we let them kind of have access to those resources. Um, and there are some other interesting things he can do. Um, he can kind of edit the assignments from here. Um, he can set teleport locations that students can teleport to. Um, and give himself some build tools if he wants to kind of quickly create something in the world. Um, but by far, the, one of the best features of Minecraft EDU is um, those kind of student management tools. Um, I found them very useful in my experience um, in the classroom, kind of trying to manage students, especially ones that I don't know very well and don't kind of have that relationship where I can say, hey, uh, I'm going to trust you guys not to do anything, and in turn, you're not going to do anything that you shouldn't be doing. Right. One of the, one of the big um, innovations in Minecraft is you can kind of do anything you can think of. Um, you can build anything, you can destroy anything you can think of, which is wonderful and empowering uh, for individuals, but sometimes you actually want them to go in a certain direction and learn something, and it's not just about doing whatever they feel like, and so you do kind of have to put some limits on what they're allowed to do, uh, and as Rebecca was, was talking about. So. There's a lot of great um, articles available online for kind of the softer side, non-technical side of using Minecraft in the classroom describing kind of the different ways that you can interact with your students, um, and the balance between letting them kind of go creative and free form and be off task versus trying to keep them on a set path. We've linked to one of them at the bottom of the resources page, and I think it's a really great read um, if you're considering using Minecraft in your classroom. Um, but since we're kind of presenting something on the more technical side, I think we're going to move on to some of the resources available for teachers. Um, in the form of downloading the worlds. So users can share worlds that they've created um, online, and other people can download them and use them and play around with them. Um, the tutorial world that I'm still on right here is actually a downloadable world that you could go and kind of put in there. Um, there's a lot of worlds available for normal Minecraft, it's not even restricted to Minecraft EDU, that have a lot of great educational content. Um, people have built scale models of pretty much any kind of famous architectural site that you can imagine. Somebody's working on a scale model of all of Manhattan, um, and which you can kind of explore to kind of discover humanity concepts. Basic Minecraft is great for lessons on volume and area because of the giving your students a limited resource of blocks and then figuring out how they can fill a queue with the blocks they have. Um, it offers a lot of spatial reasoning, kind of similar to the qubits you can use um, you know, physical wooden cubits you use in classrooms sometimes, but a lot of kids get more engaged when it's in the game. Um, there's also some and resources. Building and destroying and then rebuilding. And yeah. Because why build it out of little wooden cubits when you can make it out of nether quartz? <laughs> Whatever that is. Yes. Um, but there are also some resources uh, available on Minecraft you can use website um, that help a lot with kind of more stimulated concepts. Um, so one of them is the decimal triathlon. This world is cute. I love it. Um, it's basically a quiz combined with a race in Minecraft. So the kids are racing through different areas. They're running. They're swimming. They're using a boat um, to try to get through these areas. And, and every once in a while, there's a checkpoint with a word, math word problem. Um, these ones specifically involve very basic multiplication and division skills. Um, it asks you, I think most of them ask, if you're going this fast and you have this far to travel, how long will it take you to get there? 
Um, and then there's a little area, and they answer the question by like jumping down a pit with the right answer right above it. So it's a multiple choice question. And if they get it right, they get a little prize that helps them move a little faster and complete the race a little easier. So it's a pretty self-guided world. It's one you can kind of release your students into, and they kind of run with it and take, take it over themselves. Doesn't need a lot of teacher interaction, and is a kind of cool way to give a quiz in a class when your kids might not normally like quizzes, uh, your students might not normally like quizzes, especially because it keeps track of what students have answered questions correctly or incorrectly. Um, it puts it on a scoreboard everyone can see. Um, or that you can disable so that only you can see it. So not only is it fun, but you're also kind of getting, getting track of their progress. Um, it comes with a downloadable PDF that has the questions on it that your student, you can ask your students to write down while they're going through. And you can collect that at the end of class. And it's just cute. A lot of the reviewers say they use it on like the last day of a summer camp just to have the kids raise each other. Um, it's a fun world um, to kind of run around in. Um, and you could easily modify the signs and put your own questions in there to kind of customize it to whatever material you wanted to present to the class. Um, links on there and also in our presentation sheet and you can kind of go download that. Horse Racing is another mod made by the same um, creator, the same person who made the decimal triathlon. This is an interesting world. It's not nearly as self-guided. You're definitely going to have to kind of come up with a lesson plan and tell your students what they want to be doing. But it leverages something that already exists in Minecraft, horses, um, which are a, a mob or a uh, animal that students can tame and ride. Minecraft horses on their own have naturally varying speeds, um, much like real horses. Some of them are just faster than others, and some of them are better jumpers than others. But you can't tell by looking at the horse. You can only tell by riding on it. So horse racing is a world where there's four different uh, colored stables, so students can divide into differently colored teams, which you can kind of see on the aerial view, and choose the horses out of their stables and race them against each other. It will actually time um, the students' races to the nearest hundredths of the second and display it on the screen, um, which is a really cool feature, and there's also a scoreboard everyone can see with the students' fastest time on it, which is great. Um, it lends itself really well to lessons of range, median, mode, and other kind of basic statistical concepts. Because you can ask your kids to use these to find the fastest horse and then race against each other um, to kind of figure out what that is. You can ask them to collect the data um, for that and use it in other ways. Um, so it's a tool for learning, uh, much the same way as you might do something, interact with the physical world and take measurements in your classroom. But it's something that the students might be a little more engaged in. Um, and excited about um, and I just I think it's a lot of fun it's the kind of thing that I really wish I could have played when I was a student so I'm excited about it um, this is um, kind of a personal plug for our um, offices project world of power um, it's a world that's available for free online it uses some mods that add um, electricity generation and um, kind of wind turbines solar panels a lot of sources of both clean and not clean energy that you can use to power machines that do useful Minecraft things, like mine a pit for you. Um, you can, and you have to power it, and you have to power it safely. Um, this is uh, funded by a grant to explore both clean energy and security for the power grid. Um, there's this little area where students can create their own houses, and then they can kind of connect it to the grid and connect lights to it and kind of explore the different ways that electricity is generated or take their house off the grid by connecting solar panels and wind turbines to it. Um, it comes with a lot of lesson plans um, that you can download in PDF form that you can give to your students. I've used this extensively in an after school program at Urbana Middle School. Um, and we get, you know, playing an hour, an hour and a half a week, we get about six weeks of material off out of it with the lesson plans that are already existing. Um, and it can be kind of a useful world to introduce these concepts to them. Um, all of the resources from it are available for free at the uh, website that we've uh, linked below. And we are still working on developing kind of new content for it and new worlds along the same vein. Um, those are all the downloadable worlds we have demonstrated. There's a lot more available online um, for math, for history, for a lot of different educational concepts. And so even if a lot of them will work without Minecraft EDU, so I'd recommend going in to check even if you don't end up using Minecraft EDU in your classroom. 
because they're really amazing resources. Um, most of them developed by teachers and already used and tested in their classrooms. Um, we're not connected to the internet. No, we are. I just don't seem to have uh, typed in correctly. And clearly, we had a display problem going on, switching between uh, sources here. Uh, okay. Yeah, Michael's pulled up the uh, World Library for Minecraft EDU. Um, so this is kind of newest first, sorted. You see somebody's made a model of Alberta, Canada that you can explore. Um, they just made that in Minecraft um, with the terrain features. Um, and some other stuff that people have used. If he heads, heads to search options on the right um, and source by ascending, he'll get kind of the most popular worlds. Um, these are some kind of interesting ways. A lot of the most popular ones are the ones that come with lesson plans and handouts. Um, and are kind of the most full featured. But there's new stuff getting added all the time. So um, a lot of times there's at least something you can start off of and then maybe build up to kind of match your classroom material. So here's all the ones that have been tagged with map. And you can see the list just keeps going and going and going. So potentially a good resource, download the world um, and, and try it out. See, see if it looks like it would work in your classroom. Okay, so we want to uh, reiterate uh, that we are not making any money from this and we are not trying to sell you something. We are not involved with the makers of Minecraft EDU. You get no royalties uh, um, or any other kickbacks. Mm, yes. <laughs> but it's, uh, Minecraft EDU is one of the cheapest ways to kind of deliver Minecraft to your classroom and it's the one that we have the most experience with using. Um, so we're going to kind of describe its licensing process. Um, for Minecraft EDU, you, you'll have to buy purchase licenses for each server that you want to run and one for each simultaneous user. What that means is if you have a computer lab and you want your kids to use Minecraft EDU in the computer lab, you'll use buy one Minecraft EDU server license um, and that will give you kind of permission to run the server that Michael has over there. And then you'll buy one client license for each computer in your lab. You don't have to buy one for each student and you get to use these forever. Um, so if you have turnover, you know, kind of no matter how many um, different periods you have using Minecraft, as long as you only have so many users using it at once, um, you only have to buy that many licenses, which is different from um, the model we're going to kind of show you later. There's, a few, there's about three different options for licensing Minecraft. Um, this is the only one where you buy licenses once and you don't have to again. Yeah, these are perpetual licenses. So you don't have to renew them every year? No. no. Um, they they work better. Yeah. Um, so. It is more expensive than licensing education edition, which we will get to um, up front. Potentially, but depending on how you Depending use on it. how many students you have, yes. So what, what you have. In the one-to-one -one computing world, this could get pricey. Yes. Um, it kind of works better if you're using the same computers with multiple students throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, each time you're using the same license. And this is where you asked earlier if students could kind of go home and use it. As long as, you know, legally, you're not allowed to have more simultaneous users than you have access, the installers, as you probably noticed, don't ask you for your license keys. So it's kind of an honor code system to say you're not doing it. So you can send, send the installers home with your kids and have them install it on their home machines or have them install it on the laptop at school and bring the laptop home and they can play it from home if the server's still up or play it in single player mode and kind of do their homework there or explore the world a little more, a bit more there. Um, and that's something that they can do. But legally, you should make sure that you will never have more simultaneous users than what you bought licenses for. Um, it's a, Minecraft TDU is available only to public and private schools, including colleges, universities, and K through 12 edu educators. Libraries, museums, or registered charities and nonprofits using the software and structured educational programs, which is an exact quote from the website. Interpret that as you will. Um, if you are not one of these organizations and still want to use uh, Minecraft, you can't use Minecraft EDU. So you're going to want to have to look at another Minecraft licensing option to kind of use it in a group. Um, Minecraft licensing. So another option, if you don't want to use Minecraft EDU, is buy a copy of Minecraft for each student and just run a normal Minecraft server. 
You're not going to get the features of Minecraft EDU like student freezing, um, some of the other stuff we showed you earlier, but it is a way for everybody to connect and use Minecraft. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of Minecraft EDU work resources will work for normal vanilla Minecraft if you do a little finagling. Um, so you'll have to buy, legally for Minecraft regulations, you can't buy one for every computer. You have to buy a copy of Minecraft for every individual student. Um, and the per student licenses are more expensive than the client licenses. Um, you may or may not have to also buy one copy for your server, depending on kind of what you're using to host. Um, and that's where you might want to look into um, uh, off-site external hosting, going with a hosting company somewhere, uh, if your school can set that up. Um, there are tons of services out there that will offer to host Minecraft servers for you that every student's or friends or whatever can do. Yes. That might be a good option if you're just doing regular Minecraft. Yeah. Um, Minecraft Education Edition. So <laughs> after Breaking we had news. already <laughs> submitted this uh, talk proposal, Micro Microsoft announced that it had bought Minecraft EDU. Um, so they bought Minecraft a couple years ago, but Minecraft EDU was sort of continuing on as its own thing until like two weeks ago. Yes, so information about this is still kind of being released. For the moment, you can still buy Minecraft EDU licenses, but at some point in the coming year, that's going to stop and they're not gonna sell those anymore. So if you're looking into buying Minecraft EDU for your class, you might wanna get on it before the summer. Um, Minecraft Education Edition, there isn't a lot of information released about it yet, including a release date. Um, but it's sometime this summer, hopefully, and theoretically, the licenses will be $5 per student per year. So you have to pay $5 for each student, not for each computer, and you have to renew that annually. Um, this will give their students their own kind of login and password that they will use to access things. You're also going to have to buy licenses for each teacher who's using the software. Um, that is their aim. We won't really know until they release it what licensing is going to cost. Um, also, very importantly, Minecraft Education Edition probably won't support mods, which are additional content for Minecraft kind of developed by users to enhance gameplay functionality. Um, every world we have showed you so far, except for the tutorial world, uses at least one mod. Um, they add things like journals for the students, um, electricity, um, most kind of worlds that kind of emulate physics concepts will use a mod. So a lot of contact, content won't be available to you using Minecraft Education Edition unless Microsoft decides to support mods, which looks unlikely. Um, right now they say they have no plans for it. Yeah. And so. it being Microsoft, they don't historically tend to like to integrate well with others. They tend to like to control things a bit. I mean, to make their thing and so we don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to make it an open system. Which doesn't mean the Minecraft Education Edition isn't um, a useful tool for the classroom, but it's a consideration you're going to want to take into account um, when you're talking with your school about kind of how you're going to license the product once you've decided to use it in your classroom. Um, so this is the technical slide um, with the system requirements. We can skip this for the moment. Um, gives you information about kind of how powerful of a computer you need but if you, to run. If you're starting server. to get set up, referring to this or giving it to your school's IT um, is kind of a useful jumping off point to figure out if you have the hardware necessary to play the game. Um, and here's some additional notes. Uh, most importantly, Minecraft will, because it is cross-platform, it will run on Windows 7, 8.1, or 10, or Mac, and most Linux machines. It will not run on Chromebook for Chromebook laptops, Android or iOS tablets, or any other device that can't install Java, including Windows phones and um, various other operating systems. I'm probably forgetting. Um, but the big, the big, big laptop operating systems are supported. Um, also, you've heard me talk about this a little. Minecraft has different major versions. This is just normal Minecraft, not Minecraft EDU. Essentially. They'll release a huge batch of features at once and call that a new major version. And then they'll need to release lots of bug fixes for all the features. 
And so it'll kind of climb up. So it's never, the major version is never 1.5.0 or 1.6.0. It's always 1.5.1 or 1.6.4 or 1.7.10. Version 7 took a lot of time for them to kind of get their stuff together. After it's what we call stable, where we think it mostly works most of the time, that's kind of what people will release content for, uh, mods for and things like that. Um, mods and sometimes worlds will not work for the Minecraft version. They won't for any Minecraft version other than one they were written on. So right now, the most popular Minecraft versions are 1.7.10 and 1.8.9 um, for mods. But 1.6.4 was around for a very, very long time. So there's also a lot of stuff available for it. And a lot of Minecraft EDU worlds are written in it. Minecraft EDU has not released support for 1.8.9, but have promised to do so before they stop kind of supporting the product. So that will be available. Um, in the next couple of months. Yes. Um, so Ma so, I, so yes. you have to have Minecraft EDU and Minecraft, and Minecraft to run EDU? So no. Yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My, so Minecraft is bundled within Minecraft EDU? And Minecraft EDU will give you a download for every single one of those different versions. Yes. So we downloaded the 1.7.10 version and installed that when we were downloading. But they also have a download for 1.6.4. It just gives you a different installer that you double click and run. So if I want to do install. this world from this teacher, and they wrote it at 1.6. whatever, mm -hmm. and then I want to also do this other one in this other world, I may actually have to have them launch yeah. Yes. You, may have to you might have to have two different versions both. of it installed, Install. which is what I have on here. Okay. Um, it's totally it's possible to do that as long as you just say, put this one in this folder. It's very, very self-contained. It just actually, installs itself into a single folder and runs from there. You can actually see, kind of, I have on here one launcher for 174 and one launcher, this is 164, which I haven't labeled. So this is 1610, uh, it should be 1710. 1710 and 164. I just have different launchers. So you kind of set it up once, and it's a little hairy to make sure you're doing it right. But after that, you can have different versions coexisting on the same computer. They get along. They don't even notice they, they exist. So thank you very much. I know you guys have to get going. Thank you very much for, for coming to the talk. Yeah, and, thank um, you. Yeah. Is there any... <laughs>